Hi, my name is Bill Condon. I'm the director and screenwriter of Gods and Monsters. Very excited to be doing this. I have a big collection at home of um, collector's editions DVDs. And one thing I've noticed is that um, it gets frustrating when people aren't talking about the picture as it's happening. People seem to get behind. So I, 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 I think I have an interesting story to tell about how the film got made and what happened to it after it got made. But I, I, I'll find myself, um, I think, interrupting often to um, uh, talk about things as we see them. But of course, this started first with a wonderful novel by Christopher Bram called Father of Frankenstein, um, a, f a, a fantasy about what the last days of James Wells' life might have been like, um, which I read in late 1994. I'm just going to stop here. The, um, one of the things that was exciting about the book um, was that it, when I read the book, I thought it would be great to make a movie about Whale's life and, and to make it sort of in the style of Whale and put a lot of touches in. So if you see in this very next scene, um, we're introduced to Brendan Fraser's character. And what we see actually are body parts, um, which is a reference to, of course, Frankenstein. And then he emerges from his trailer and he's sort of all put together. Of course, he's self-made, which is the problem. He doesn't quite know how to do it. He needs James Whale's help to figure that out. But um, this is uh, this is actually an idea of Brendan Fraser's. I was talking one day about how um, fun it was to put all of these little things in there, and he says, "Well, he said, what about that?" Um, and I thought it was a really good idea. So that's how we started. Um, one of the things I've discovered going traveling with the movie all around the world is that people start to see things in the film that you never really intended. For example, here, somebody said that this next shot when Brendan um, climbs. Uh, this hill to go up to Pacific Coast Highway that it suggested that here, here the monster was going up toward the gods, that he was ascending to Whale's world, which I thought was a great idea, but completely unintended. Um, so as I say, all these names that, I, uh, that you see, I will have lots to say about at some point, um, all of them so important to the making of the film. Um, let me start again at the beginning with Chris's novel. It, it, um, Chris was originally contacted by a documentary filmmaker for the BBC called Brian Skeet to help him write a documentary about James Whale. And as they started to do it, they discovered that there was actually very little footage. There was no footage of James Whale. He made a brief appearance in his film One More River, um, but otherwise there was no film of him, and they realized that it would be very hard to pu pull his documentary together. So then a little while later, Chris asked Brian if he minded if he took some of this material that he'd gathered and, and uh, do something with it. And Brian said, of course. Now, let me interrupt again. Here we have Lynn Redgrave with David Dukes. Lynn's character is Hannah, the Teutonic housekeeper. This is another example of uh, something that really comes from a whale film. He populated his movies with this gallery of eccentrics, and um, specifically Uno O'Connor in The Bride of Frankenstein and The Invisible Man was somebody that Lynn took a look at. And um, I always marvel at how she managed to pull this off. She put little touches um, from that style of acting into the performance without letting it go over the top. Part of the fun of uh, having Ian e. McKellen and David Dukes together is that they sort of, their paths have crossed a few times. Ian was a big success in Bent in London and then in New York, David Dukes um, originated, um, actually it was the, the other part, but he was in the original cast opposite Richard Gere and then when Ian did Amadeus on Broadway and left, David Dukes replaced him. So there's a little bit of history between them. Uh, just to go back now, Chris, when he was writing the novel, had Ian McKellen in mind. He sent the novel to Ian McKellen. Ian actually didn't read it the first time around. Um, and then it was sent around to studios, but it was right after Ed Wood had opened. And whereas when people had heard about the novel, they said, ooh, another Ed Wood. Uh, by the time Chris was finished and was showing it around, it was, ugh, another Ed Wood, because Ed Wood, uh, despite all of the acclaim, didn't make any money. So that's... Uh, why I was able to um, get involved. I, we actually have a mutual friend at Psychoff who um, introduced me. See, I'm doing what I um, said I wouldn't do. I'm getting behind the picture. I just wanted to talk about Brandon Cliley, who plays um, Ian as a young man. I thought he was really a, a, so close to, to him, and, and he himself is a 
really interesting young kid who's been in a number of horror movies and um, is obsessed with Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. But, um, yeah, so I contacted Chris, uh, ha having been introduced through Ed, and um, he looked at a few of my movies and, and luckily gave me the okay to go ahead and have my way with his book. I should say a little bit more about, I guess, the guy with the white hair. Um, he was on my wall, too, as I started to write, and when, we, when I finished the script um, through my agent, Ken Hardy, uh, we were able to get him to read it. Took took a little while. He read the script first, and then later he read the book, and then agreed to meet in Los Angeles. And we met at Clive Barker's house. He was interested. We met again the next day, and he said his biggest concern was that at this point in his life, he decided that he really was interested in becoming a uh, presence in movies. And he just agreed to do At Pupil, where he was going to play a 77-year-old Nazi. And now if you played James Whale, this man at death's door, he was afraid that people who really didn't know who he was would think he was an ancient actor. Um, I reminded him that he'd also be playing Whale at the age of 45, directing Bride of Frankenstein, and showed him a picture of Whale at the time. And he said, oh, he's rather dishy, and agreed to do the part, thank God. Uh, so, and Brendan, of course, I've uh, skipped over him, but he was critical in us uh, getting the movie finance. He was the last actor to agree to do the part. Always really a first choice. Ironically, when you put a movie like this together, so much of it depends on um, financing from uh, overseas. And Brendan, at that moment, his stock was pretty low, so they kept... Um, resisting making an offer to him. I just thought he was so right that finally they let us do it. And of course, two weeks into shooting, George of the Jungle opened and suddenly everyone was very excited. This was shot on a set, by the way. This, these, these flashbacks to England were shot on a set at the Lacey Studios, a kind of low-rent dive near downtown where Cagney and Lacey uh, was originally shot. I would like to say a few words about the production design. Richard Sherman and I um, looked around for a long time for a house that would be similar to Wales. Whale lived on Amalfi Drive in uh, Pacific Palisades. And the exterior that you see here, or you saw in the previous scene, um, which is in Altadena, is very, very close to what his house looked like. Unfortunately, we could never find the interior for it. The, the house we were looking for was the classic kind of Beverly Hills, colonial, 30s, 40s house, not dissimilar from the one you would have seen on something like the Donna Reed show, you know. Uh, um, that's what the house looked like, and it was fun having this Tweedy English gentleman um, in this unlikely setting. We were never able to get that house because okay. the kitchens in there invariably had been uh, redone and were filled with marble and didn't make any sense. And because we shot this movie on such a tight schedule in 24 days, we could afford to split up the exterior and the interior, but we couldn't afford to let the kitchen be at a separate location. So we came, we, we found this house, and because it wasn't the, the perfect match, um, Richard came up with this idea, this these chocolate brown walls, what he calls this Elsie DeWolf. She was a great society um, decorator. Uh, Elsie DeWolf influenced approach, almost as though Whale had uh, decorated the house when he'd moved in in the 40s and, and sort of updated as the years went by. And I think it works very nicely, but um, um, I think both Richard and I f still wonder what, what it would have been like to have, to have the house we originally intended. Jack Plotnick's just arrived. He's playing this interviewer. And again, um, another character, uh, slightly exaggerated at moments, who could have stepped out of um, a whale movie, I think. Um, Fruity, as fruity in his own way as some of the characters that Ernest Thesker played in, in uh, Old Dark House and The Bride of Frankenstein. You know, we've seen a few flashbacks um, up to now, and we're going to see another one. Uh, I didn't want to tell the story of Whale's life in traditional biopic fashion, sort of going from um, highlight to highlight. So instead, I, I thought it better to give these little bits of information. Whale had this terrible ailment that did make him lose his ability to concentrate, uh, which is a nice device for a filmmaker. But I thought it was important, too, that each of these flashbacks be more um, emotional than 
actually, uh, you know, here, for example, what you learn from this flashback, first of all, is that he's lying, that he, he makes up stories about his past, but also it becomes a memory of a moment of humiliation um, that his father uh, accuses him of being girlish. And that, of course, the, the father's approval or lack of it uh, becomes a theme that, that runs throughout the movie. Um, the scene with the interviewer serves the same function in the movie as it does in the novel. There are plenty of people who don't know who James Whale is, and it's a nice way to be able to get out a, a lot of information about him. And, uh, of course, that's a tough scene to pull off because there's an awful lot of exposition. So Chris came up with the idea of the strip tease, which is about to begin. I think here there's a wonderful um, example, as you look at all this, of just how much Ian McKellen brought to this part. Right now, as he's recounting a story, it's with a cer certain ironic detachment and amusement. Then he realizes, as the boy asks about Frankenstein, that the kid isn't interested in what he has to say much at all, just the movies. And you see the rage. It's almost as though 15 years of people having reduced him to just the guy who made Frankenstein is captured in that one moment. And because of the ailment, he's almost unable to control it. And then you see him sort of getting that control back here, and now he's amused again and decides to play a game with him. Ian, of course, always just amazed me and everybody with how much he's able to suggest of all of this. Um, let me backtrack now to some of the story of making it. Once Ian was involved, we took it around to a lot of studios. I should also mention Clive Barker because... Uh, Greg Feinberg, the producer, and I had made a movie with Clive, and we took this to him. First of all, there are so many parallels between Clive's life and Wales. Um, expatriates living in Hollywood, making horror movies, painters openly gay. Uh, Clive, ironically, had been um, asked to narrate this documentary of Brian Skeets that never got made, so he was already connected in some tangential way to Chris Bram's book. And... Um, he's trying to use his name and influence to help people get movies made that interest him. So he said he would come, come aboard as our godfather and um, was just a great sounding board and, and um, also there to make the right phone call. These movies have a tendency to fall apart nine or ten times before they get made and he was always there with the help, the right help that we needed. Um, Too warm for a jacket anyway. So we had Clive, we had Ian, we had the script. We were looking for our $3 million to make the movie and we brought it around to all the places you'd expect and everybody said no, it was, it was disheartening. Even the places that you thought might have been um, open to telling a gay story were actually gay friendly were put off by the fact that we had at the center of this movie a complicated gay character who, to some people, um, his behavior fit into certain unpleasant stereotypes from years past. You know, an older gay man who's still predatory, for example. Of course, my argument always was that this was being told from the inside. You know, he was the host of this movie, and therefore, and that had never been done before. He was certainly not, not treated as a scary character as he might have been before. But there were people who argued, well, here's, you've got James Whale, and he had this great success um, in the 1930s, movie after movie, as an openly gay man, why not tell that story? And of course, the reason is that it's just not as rich dramatically. Um, but finally, um, Paul Collegeman uh, and his partners at Regent Entertainment decided to take the movie on. They were a new company, and... Um, it took them a while to get everything together. People often ask when you go on these tours what advice you might have for younger filmmakers trying to make independent movies. And I think the best piece of advice I could give them is, is finally, um, you need to put a gun to people's heads to really get a movie made. And we had a gun to our heads. Ian McKellen had committed to go back to an 18-month 
run at the National Theater. We needed to be shooting this movie by the summer of 1997. So um, as we got closer and closer, things really, really sped up until finally, as I said before, I was able to make the offer to Lynn Redgrave and to Brendan Fraser and to Lolita Davidovich. And those four names together, not alone was enough to get us finance, but those four names together did the trick. Uh, we had about $3 million, a little more when you include all the banking charges and the deferments and a 24-day schedule. And it was tight, but it was something I always knew. I, even when I was writing the script, given what it was about, given that I didn't have um, any cachet as a director, uh, I knew we'd never get much more than that. So I wrote the script in a way that... 60% of it actually is a three-hander. It really is is in, at Whale's house in the scenes between uh, Whale and Clay and Hannah. And it would just open up at various places um, in two um, big scenes, one at George Cukor's house and one on the set of Bride of Frankenstein, kind of an old early Merchant Ivory trick I'd read, read about, which is save all your money for a couple of scenes. But when you have a movie that is so... Um, interior and involves so much talk. Obviously, the first challenge is to make sure that it's visually interesting. As, as early as when I first read the novel, I thought it would be fun to shoot the movie not in the style of a, of a whale film, but actually in the style of the period in which it's set in the 1950s. Um, real widescreen go technicolor approach. Uh, a world in which, again, this tweedy English gentleman would really seem out of place. And then as these flashbacks start, they are more in the, style, in the expressionist style that Whale favored. And then I think you'll see later on, as that line between the past and the pre present really blurs for Whale, so too do these styles. So that even as we remain in, in widescreen, for example, after the Cukor party, when he's been especially disoriented. When you come back, the angles are skewed and there are hard shadows and the light falls off on either side of the screen so that it has a square shape, more uh, 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 similar to the Academy ratio that Whale worked in. So that you're really, you know, I don't think anyone is meant to notice that, but there just would be a sense that of the kind of disorientation that Whale felt. Here, now, there weren't that many changes between the, the script and the actual final cut of the movie. But this is one example of a scene where, in the script, I'd had a, a moment where he remembers being humiliated at his job as a teenager at the hands of his father at a, a factory. And images of the men who worked there that would connect later on with the image, the famous image of the monster that Whale created. We weren't able, actually, one of the things we had to sacrifice as we shot was that that uh, factory set uh, so that we did it in a more abstract way with just his father looming down at him, and it never really worked. So instead, I introduced, uh, at an earlier moment than I'd originally intended, images from the war because um, I think that connects as well with the creation of the monster as the sort of Dickensian background that, that Whale had. Uh, the writer, David Skull, who actually made the documentary that's also on this DVD, uh, has pointed out that, that um, it was really the experience of the First World War, a time when, with medical advances, men could be mutilated and still survive. In the 20s, people were surrounded suddenly by these images that, that they weren't used to. And he, he makes a direct connection between that and this explosion of horror in the movies in the 20s and 30s, and I think it is probably true. Certainly Whale's uh, gallows humor um, and sense of irony and detachment, you'd have to say, would come from that. Here's, here's okay, this is an interesting scene that, again, I had had a little later in the script. But in the novel, Whale speculates almost from the beginning about killing himself, and this is an example of something where the rich interior lives of characters in the novel have to be visualized. So I thought this little moment of him imagining what it would be like for Hannah to find him uh, would tell us what we needed to know at that point. 
and it seemed very typically um, whale. You know, the fact that that uh, he'd be amused enough by that idea to uh, to put aside those thoughts for the night. This is a scene that actually, the one that we just saw, that actually in the script came after he'd watched The Bride of Frankenstein. And we shot an alternative version with Lynn Redgrave where she came in in the costume of Uno O'Connor in that movie. And um, it was funny, but uh, obviously I couldn't use it earlier because the audience hadn't been exposed to that image yet, but also it, it seemed maybe just a little too on the nose. So here we are, uh, Whale's first invitation to Brendan. And um, another thing that changed slightly from the script is that in the script, there were a few scenes that we saw of Brendan uh, picking up a girl, getting up the next morning, seeing that he, he's brutish in his own way, doesn't really know how to, how to relate to a woman um, on anything but the most basic level. And what I discovered is even though... Uh, it was important to start the movie with him because, like Sunset Boulevard, I think it felt that you needed a guide, even though this is hardly a normal character, he's probably a more relatable character for an audience than, than Whale is, so you needed someone to introduce you in, into Whale's world, that this character really had to earn his way into the movie. Uh, and cutting to him earlier on, as I had originally intended in the script, just didn't work. You just resented the time that uh, you you spent away from Whale. And I think as this character starts to reveal himself, as he starts to be drawn out by Whale, he starts to earn the right to uh, uh, have more time spent with him. So Steve Katz, the director of photography, did an incredible job, I think, on this movie, making these dialogue scenes rich and interesting. But... Um, You'll also notice, again, we shot so quickly that there were times when um, we all wanted to have an extra take and there simply wasn't time to do it. So there's a scene coming up here where we move in on Whale. There's a shot where we move in on Whale and there's a big bump in the middle of it. And one of the um, advantages of claiming uh, Whale as a model for this movie is that I can say that those things are... are um, just homages to Whale because Whale was famous for uh, not being too interested in technical perfection. So I think you'll see it coming up right here as as uh, Brendan goes over to let Lynn in and then we move and then it gets a little bumpy there. Well, maybe it's not so. I think I notice that stuff more probably than other people do. So to backtrack a little and get into where we were, uh, we, we got the movie financed. Um, we had a good... Uh, long period of rehearsal. Ian and Brendan spent a lot of time together just getting to know each other. And the period of making the movie itself was just very easy in its own way. It was... Um, people were so into it, and we, we knew we had such a short time that... I don't know, it just... All the difficulty really was came before and getting it financed and then after once it was done. But the actual shooting of the film was a complete pleasure. I should point out that the painting there uh, next to Ian is an actual James Whale painting. A friend of mine, Joel, Joel Cohen, had seen in The Recycler that um, a dozen of Whale's paintings were being sold for some ridiculously low amount of money while I was writing the script. And... and uh, called up this man who was the son of someone who had worked um, on the property and was selling them. Uh, so that nude, which Ian always liked to think of as a self-portrait, not of Ian, but of Whale, uh, uh, was one of the paintings. And, and actually the, the um, studio was sprinkled with them, including one of the studio itself. And it's this is a pretty good likeness of what that studio was looked like. Um, Good recreation, I should say. Now, th this moment, I think, is is a good example of what Brendan Fraser brought to this part that I think nobody else could have. It's the hardest part in the movie, actually. He's, by definition, a character who is inarticulate. There's a lot going on under the surface. Um, he's also someone who has to sit uh, and have his portrait taken and be quiet while um, Ian entertains us and, and talks a lot. So... Uh, it, it's almost a technical challenge as a director to be able to have somebody uh, to cut to and hold the screen with him. And I think if you notice here, what Brendan can do with so little, his comic instincts are just so refined. And he just, you know, 
after rehearsing this, it really, I mean, obviously Ian's doing all this incredible stuff too. There's such a slyness to everything that's happening there. But, but with Brendan, um, I think, you know, I was just reading a review of his new movie and someone said he's cornered the market on naives. And it's really true. The, he had just endless variations um, on this idea of somebody who uh, kind of doesn't get it, but underneath does. Uh, he, um, when I was done with the film, when I had my cut done, I sent a tape of it to Ian yeah. in London, and he watched it over and over and over again. Excellent. Came over here to do any Enemy of the People, and we set up a screening for him to watch it with other actors from the show. First time he'd seen it on screen, and the first thing he said when it was over was, I have a lot to learn from that boy. And it was something he was he was saying a lot, uh, constantly when we were making the film, too, that, that um, there's something about the economy of what Brenda Fraser can do um, and the way he knows the camera so well that that really, um, really is impressive. Hello. Hi. Um, look, I know you already paid me. I'm just here to like... The master is waiting for you. He's down in his studio. This is the real James Whale, by the way. A photo of him. Um, I'm sorry, lady. You're going to have to take this. I'm Behind Brendan in that scene, I'm a little late there, were these murals of practically naked men, WPA murals, that were done on the library walls of a high school in San Pedro. And it just seemed like Again, too good a, a kind of James Will joke not to put in there that even as Brendan goes away from Will's world to, to someplace more neutral, he's surrounded by these gay images. In fact, at the very end of the movie, Brendan is finally married, and the woman who plays his wife, a wonderful actress who unfortunately had so little to do in this movie called Lisa Dar, right after we finished, got the role of uh, Ellen's girlfriend on the, the Ellen show, so even his wife was a lesbian. Um, sure not in real life, of course, but uh, he really is surrounded. So this is the first, the first studio scene. About 20% of the movie takes place just on this set. So again, the challenge was to make it as rich and interesting as possible, which I think Richard Sherman managed to pull off so well. I've worked with Richard a lot, and um, it, it's interesting when you work on a film and go to a designer's house a few months later and see all the best bits of furniture, this was the movie where, where it worked in reverse, that all the good stuff from his house got, got uh, tossed onto a truck and put onto this set. But I think Richard was the f perfect choice for this movie because if you go to his house, he, he has such impeccable taste. He lives in the kind of house that James Whale would have lived in himself. Um, I, I'd also like to talk about the costume designer, Bruce Finlayson. He did a remarkable job, I think, with so little money. And one of the cleverest things he did was... Um, he built all of Ian's costumes, and uh, he made them progressively larger so that by the time you get to the Cucar party and the end of the movie, they're really swimming on him a bit. So you do get the sense that uh, this man is getting more and more frail. But everything from the little splash of color, the way he worked with the overall design, I think is pretty incredible. The other, uh, uh, you know, big thing about Ian's a look in this movie is the white hair and that posed a real problem for us whale had a beautiful head of snow white hair and that's the hardest thing to get to uh uh in dyeing somebody's hair usually it comes out yellow or if you really try to do it uh, more than once the hair will fall out so it was a real problem we knew we couldn't use wigs we just didn't have the time to do them well enough and to spend that time on lighting and uh Ian was a bit unsure in the beginning, but, but then said, oh, just go ahead and do it. And I remember uh, leaving him and going off to meetings for about three hours and coming back. And I felt as though it was my own unveiling of the bride. You know, there he was suddenly with this beautiful head of white hair. And I could see oh, within minutes little bits of James Whale starting to emerge. It really is when it, when it, it fell into place. This is about 10 days before we started to shoot. Um, and I actually think there's something about the white hair and it being off of his forehead that lets you see Ian's eyes for the first time. He has such beautiful blue eyes. And um, I feel as though they haven't kind of popped in the same way in movies before. Um, so I kind of recommended that he keep it, but he, had, he would have none of that. Uh, 
So back to the story of, of uh, what happened with this movie. We, we did finish the movie in 24 days and spending every penny we had and a little more because it really was so tight. Put it together. Ginny Katz edited it, and she really is just so gifted. I can't tell you the, the um, rhythm that she built into these scenes and the moments that she was able to find. It just really amazed me, the first cut that she put together of this film. Not so different from the way it wound up. Um, and then we have the challenge of finding a composer for so little money. We sent it to Carter Burwell, and, um, you know, Carter can do basically anything he wants, and because he's done some studio movies recently, uh, I think he sees those jobs as subsidizing things like this, so um, he agreed to do it. I sat with him uh, in New York for one 14-hour mm, day as we watched the movie, uh, and then he went off to Big Sur and started sending back tapes of um, VHS tapes of certain parts of the score, and I could tell immediately that what I'd hoped for was there, you know, that, that sense of restraint and also the idiosyncratic approach that, uh, you know, again, James Whale took to his movies and Carter's taken to all of his work for the Coen brothers and for other people. But I was surprised in this scene, as Whale was talking about his childhood, suddenly there appeared this waltz, and it seemed slightly inappropriate. And... Um, I didn't know exactly what Carter was up to. And I mentioned it to him, and he said, well, why don't you just wait, which is always good advice, I think. And as I got more and more tapes, it finally emerged, the idea that uh, he was working with, uh, that, that rather than do the obvious thing and kind of take some Franz Waxman scores, for example, from Bride of Frankenstein, since this whole movie is a variation on that film, he would... Um, go back to the back to Waxman's and all those other expatriates roots and really write a dirge for um, that Euro European culture that civilization that got destroyed by the first world war and I think this theme is where you really hear that and it's this theme that connects all of those ideas in the movie connects World War one to the horror films and then to this life that Wales leading now so uh, I can't tell you the difference that um, Carter made to this movie. Just that shot there, that split diopter shot, that's an example of something I think I fought so hard to do this movie in widescreen, which is always a fight because of obviously video, and, and we did it in Super 35 so that we could open up this image for um, v VHS, and people would not have things cut off, and we didn't have to do pan and scan, but um, things like that, being able to really connect faces in a shot um, when they're, when a connection is being made, when they're finally talking to each other. To play with that, I think, is one, one of the reasons that the film uh, has a visual life to it and just doesn't, uh, you know, seem like a talking heads film. And here's Lolita making her first appearance and Kevin O'Connor, whom I love in the background, who had one other scene that got cut out, so... Um, so underused, but um, he really did me a favor by, by, by being in the movie. Lolita's character, this, I have to say, this whole scene, very similar to the one in the book. In, in the book, they watch the film and then Whale and um, Hannah watch it separately. So the only difference in the, in the movie is that they, you know, we intercut all of them watching at the same time, but it was an idea that really, really uh, appeal to me, something I felt I hadn't seen in a movie before, which is watching different people watch the same movie and realizing that films are only what you can bring to them. So that each of these characters sees something so different in the film. Lolita's character, who I think considers herself something of a 50s hipster, all she can see is the way in which the film has dated. So she feels superior to the film and starts to laugh at it. This is um, 
I don't know, for people who love to go to revival houses, there's a type of person that you run into all the time and you often wonder why they bother to go because the, 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 the only pleasure they seem to take is in feeling superior to, to uh, the style in which the movie was made. Now, Whale is watching it and he's remembering all these touches. Here we go. This is Ono O'Connor. Uh, uh, all these touches that he put into the film. H Hannah watches it the way a child would. I mean, she absolutely sees it on the simplest level. It's frightening, it's disgusting, it's scary. Um, this is Ernest Thesiger, of course, um, who was in two of Wales' movies, and who was a um, friend of Wales and um, was a upper-class man in real life and somebody, somebody who Wales modeled himself on to a certain degree. In fact, David Lewis didn't like him at all because when he would stay with them, he would suddenly you know, treat David Lewis like the servant in the house. Finally, then you have, of course, um, Brendan watching the movie, and Brendan is responding to the monster in some way. He's seeing underneath it the poetry in the movie. He doesn't know what it is. You know, he can't put it, put it into words, but there is something right here that he sees of of uh, uh, the depth of emotion in the film. And of course, now, Whale, Whale's made that shift too because of this talk about death. That. Uh, uh, reminds him of his own present-day predicament. And these shots, by the way, are all shots that then get recreated. Those series of shots are all recreated in the uh, dream sequence that's about to come up. So, um, oh, she's hard yeah, then we have this wonderful scene. It's hard to even talk through this. Anyway, uh, there was an earlier scene when Brendan appeared as a silhouette in the door when I think, you know, it's not too hard to see that there's a bit of the Frankenstein um, uh, shape to his head. And here, of course, is the next opportunity to connect these two images. And that continues on through the movie, of course, until finally the moment when he leads Whale to the trenches, basically to his death. And what starts out as a black and white image of the monster turns into a color image of of uh, Clay Boone as he steps into the light, and then of course the final moment when he actually walks like the monster. But here we are. Um, we're about to go into this flashback, originally in two parts. Um, originally the first scene was cutting to uh, Whale coming into the, the uh, makeup room where the great makeup artist J Jack Pierce unveils Elsa for the first time. And Karloff was also in that scene, half made up as Frankenstein. And it really was a shame to lose that scene, but it was actually, again, we this was shot toward the end of our third week, and of course things have to go quicker, and time is uh, shorter, and money is run out a bit, so the makeup room itself actually turned out to be just a lot of, a lot of uh, blacks and wardrobe racks and things in a very tight space and what I found is when I looked at the film that we were just too close to Rosalind Ayres who plays um, Elsa and because Rosalind plays her both here at 1935 and later on in 1957 and in, in, in reality is somewhere between those two ages uh, the illusion of her being Elsa's age earlier uh, was was destroyed there so I had to drop that scene which was too bad because it was very fun to uh, get a glimpse of Karloff and I think it is something that people miss um, here of course uh, this is Matt McKenzie playing Colin Clive and Arthur Dignam playing Ernest Thesiger Arthur um, is an actor I'd worked with the first movie I wrote was called Strange Behavior that we made in Australia and he's a wonderful Australian actor who's in a Fred Skepsi movie, The Devil's Playground, has been in lots of stuff, and he just, as a favor, came over and, and did this for me. Um, and uh, he was unsure whether he was getting Thesiger down, and as I said, it's sort of half Thesiger and half Dignam, and that seemed just fine by me, because Arthur's just as much of a, an eccentric and wonderful character as uh, the original was, as Ernest Thesiger was. Um, and Matt McKenzie, I thought, did a wonderful job suggesting that hysteria that was always informed uh, Colin Clive's performances and also the kind of um, uh, panic about his own uh, sexuality that, that might have been a part of that, too. Um, 
Colin Clive sadly drank himself to death just a few years after he made The Bride of Frankenstein. But, of course, the real find here was Rosalind Ayres. Um, we'd met so many people, and I kind of resigned myself to having to use someone who could um, do the voice but really not look like her. And then in step Rosalind, who is 80% Elsa and 20% Susan Sarandon, um, but such a great actress. And again, looked at so much footage of Elsa, took a little moment from the prologue of The Bride of Frankenstein when uh, Lanchester as Mary Shelley tilts her head and put that into the previous scene. The coochie coo later on in the George Cukor scene. Again, I, you know, just this movie was blessed in so many ways. But to get on to uh, the story of where we, well, I guess we left off in the uh, narrative of the movie itself. We, we finished, we put it together, Carter did the score. And we got into Sundance, um, not in competition, but in a category called American Spectrum. And, uh, you know, in typical fashion, hadn't even shown the movie to an audience before we finished it and then brought it up there. We had our first screening at uh, midnight on uh, in the second week. And it went really, really well. It was very exciting. Um, great reception from the audience there. And we had a few other screenings. But... Um, didn't get picked up out of Sundance. And, and this started part two of of uh, the ordeal of Gods and Monsters. And by far, the, the year uh, getting it out there, getting it sold and getting it launched was much, it's a much harder job actually than, than making the film. Um, still confuses me why all the traditional uh, independent companies passed on the movie. Um, I don't think it was the gay content because they were buying other gay movies. Gay plus suicide maybe doesn't seem so appealing. I don't really know what it was, um, but it happened. And one of the things I discovered was that ultimately, months later, uh, the companies that were making bids for the film were all companies that hadn't, haven't, hadn't even existed a year ago. So. Um, it seemed to me, if you could generalize at all, that the, the um, Miramaxes and those major independent companies had really um, moved into a different arena with Goodwill Huntings and movie, movies like that, where they um, maybe weren't as interested in a, in a small film that needed as much uh, care as this one did. I'm going to go back now to, to what we're watching. This is the second of the three we times that we cut to this image, this, this um, stormy night. Uh, backdrop that um, was very similar to the ones that uh, Whale used in a number of films, but um, most obviously in the two Frankenstein movies. And the first one had the monster walking across the screen, actually Brandon, and this one has Whale walking across alone, and, and obviously the third one has both. That sec intermediate shot is, is a, a shot from the bride. And then again, these are shots that um, we duplicated. This is an example of one of the things you get to do in movies. Chris has been so uh, helpful and so nice about the movie. And, um, uh, you know, just as I'm jealous of him because he can put in all of those ideas and thoughts, he said he's jealous of a filmmaker when he sees something like this because you can do things that you can't do in a, in a, in a novel. This, whenever I... Um, did have a problem in adapting the book. I always found the answer in the novel, and there was one sort of, you know, random line of, line of description where Whale was wondering what it would be like to have Clay sort of um, massage his brain. And um, because I wanted to introduce here the idea that Clay was starting to emerge for Whale as somebody who might uh, help him out of the situation, uh, it just struck me that it would be fun to do it in the style of the film that we've just been watching. Uh, ironically now with Whale as the monster, because I do think uh, these two characters keep switching positions all throughout the movie. Now Whale wakes up, you'll see here, and he looks over to the pillow, and there are actually bits of grass on there. And there, the reason for that is that uh, there was an intermediate moment where he woke up when we were in close-up, and... Uh, then notices this grass and looks over and, and uh, Clay is next to him on the bed, the gardener, and um, uh, starts to strangle him and then he wakes up again. 
uh, a convention from contemporary horror movies that I thought might work there, but it it was really it just it just stuck out when when we put it together, and um, also again I thought um, brought that idea home a little too too uh, early, you know, of uh, Clay as the person who he might ask to to help kill him. Um, this scene coming up, I have to say, is one of my favorites in the film. I just think what, again, what both of these actors are doing is so remarkable. And a few weeks ago, uh, Lynn won a Golden Globe, and she thanked Michael Lindsay and Adam Cook, who did the props on the movie. She really mined this scene for, I mean, she is the comic relief of the movie. And boy, she got everything out of this, I thought. Um, and the idea of throwing the egg was hers that she did in the first rehearsal without telling any of us, even though we'd, he'd, we'd done the scene a number of times before, and it was just so wonderful. But again, Brandon, too, with those uh, great instincts of, of his, uh, that he has, um, really um, really keeps up with her. I just think they, they, they really turn this, in, this slightly expository scene into something that's very, very special and very funny. In the novel, this character of the housekeeper had been um, Mexican. And when I started to talk to people who grew up in Hollywood at the period, they, they said that that was actually wrong, that that phenomenon was really a 60s phenomenon of suburban women finally having the money to have people come in and help them and clean their houses, that, that in this time, in that world, um, you would have had a either a, um, a a black woman, a British woman, or a Middle European one. And Whale himself had two: a housekeeper and a cook, Anna and Johanna. And if you were ever invited over more than once, he would uh, line them up and quiz you about which was which. So, um, and it felt right too, just thematically, to have this Teutonic figure in this world, um, because so much of what happened to Whale was uh, connected to the history of Germany in the um, first half of the century. You know, um, the First World War, for example, obviously, with so much of uh, uh, that, that generation wiped out, there were slots open for people like Whale that otherwise wouldn't have been, so that uh, he was able to make his way in, in the theater world in London in the 20s. And obviously his first big success was as um, was it was with Journey's End, which was an anti-war play set in the trenches. Uh, that's what got him to Hollywood. And then, of course, the big setback of his life was The Road Back, the sequel to All Quiet on the Western Front, which uh, he lost control of in the middle of production. It was recut by the studio and um, turned into a major debacle from which his career really never recovered. So now we're going into this This next set in this house was one of the consolations for not getting the living room we wanted. I thought it so perfectly captured a certain kind of gay high style of the 40s and 50s with a lot of help from all the things that uh, Richard put in there. And, um, of course, this is the introduction of the Cucor idea. One of the other scenes that had been in uh, the first draft of the script, which I didn't get to shoot because of money, was it was a flashback to when Whale accompanied David Lewis to the premiere of Camille at the Chinese Theater. Lewis was the associate producer for George Cukor, and they walk up the uh, red carpet, and Whale is introduced. And he was a bit of a celebrity at the time, and so sort of, you know, all puffed up, walking uh, past all the fans. And then uh, he's described as the king of horror, and he deflates a little, you know, the idea that he was always um, trying to get out of that particular ghetto and that George Cukor obviously was somebody who had, who who uh, was given his pick, to, pick of Studio A Pictures. So the the seeds of this rivalry with Cukor and the jealousy that Will felt for Cukor would have been established in that scene. And it was a wonderful, I think, um, uh, the contrast between the Hollywood of the 30s that he remembers and the Hollywood that he's driving through as he leaves the doctor's office. And I think, too, a nice uh, moment where you saw um, his relationship with Lewis in its prime, 
But unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the money, as I said. I have to say, though, that I worked about six months on adapting the, uh, the novel, uh, writing the script, and um, it's a very faithful adaptation. Uh, Chris Bram writes wonderful dialogue, and also he had been a film critic. So I think he, because he, he um, was writing about a filmmaker, I think he created a structure that was essentially dramatically sound. So it, it um, didn't take much rethinking at all to, to turn it into a picture, into a film. Um, having spent that time writing the script, the first draft is basically what we shot. The only things that ever changed were for budget reasons and uh, little touches that the actors came up with, which were wonderful, and I was happy to put in. For example, in an earlier scene when, when uh, Lynn comes in and, and brings the iced tea for the first time, and she leaves and uh, Whale says, Comic made. That was an addition of Ian's. I thought a really wonderful idea. His, his notion was that this whole thing, this whole scheme with Brendan is a movie. It's the final movie that Whale can't get off the ground. And almost to make that explicit, each of the characters is a certain type, I thought was really, really great. Have you ever been married, Mr. Whale? Now here, this is another f uh, favorite scene, I think, where a cigar is definitely not just a cigar. I think it gets to something so essential in the story of uh, the relationship between gay men and straight men. And one of the nice things about the fact that it's set in the 50s is that Brendan's character can actually say things without any kind of embarrassment that people can just think today. But I think uh, he asks all those uh, essential, obvious questions that you ask of anybody when you that you think when you first find out that they're gay, first um, obviously uh, uh, making sure that he knows that uh, he isn't, and also do you think of me that way? That frightening, frightening question. Um, and again, the way that they uh, play this for comedy is just all that I could possibly have imagined, you know? Um, and we tried to match that visually with a very deadpan approach stepping back with these two people sort of vying across the table. Um, this cut here, uh, I'm sorry, not right here, but right at the end of the scene where you see that all of this, <laughs> through all of this, uh, a whale's been able to manipulate Brendan back into his lair. Um, Initially, it started with him ripping off a piece of paper, which would have been so effective, but it, that was tied to um, about 30 seconds of talk that ultimately didn't seem necessary. So it always has been a slight disappointment for me because I think it would have been a very, very funny moment to, to cut from this to the, the sort of paper off, almost as though he's stripping him, and, and uh, there he is. This scene is... Um, this didn't exist in the novel. It felt important to have a moment where um, uh, the Clay character decides to leave um, and then comes back just to see again that sense in which uh, Whale is having an effect on him. And despite the fact that he's gay and isn't shy about it, he's still going to overlook that because there's something more important that he's getting out of it. Um, as I said, I think there's um, a real kind of back and forth a power play between these two. They both have something the other wants. Um, Clay is young, he has a future. He's also got a certain kind of openness that uh, Whale probably um, would like to have. Whale, of course, has a big house, he's a little bit famous and has done these great things with his life and ultimately also has stories to tell that Clay would like. And of course, when someone has all of those things that you'd like, you start to resent them. So I think that's, it's sort of fun to watch that. And, and um, also the father-son relationship that kind of goes in both directions too, I think. You know, Whale, in that earlier scene, saw the father, his father sitting in, in uh, Clay's chair. And I do think that Clay does represent to a degree that kind of um, Making movies still terrifying um, 
lack of acceptance of Whale for who he is, and that erupts here. Um, Whale prompts it, which also gives you um, gives the audience another hint to this scheme that he has. It, it, it was interesting. I couldn't tell how much people would be able to figure out about that. You know, in the earlier scene, obviously, he asked him if he'd ever, ever killed anybody, and no, I wouldn't, you know, I know a man like you would break my neck, he said. And here he pushes Brendan's buttons, uh, Clay's buttons, and he sees the effect it has. Um, so there are people, I thought, who could be way ahead of us when he says, I want you to kill me. I didn't think that hurt so much. And I've talked to people who, who know the novel and know that that was, uh, you know, uh, part of the plan, and uh, that didn't seem to affect their their um, enjoyment. And obviously, for others who don't quite get it, there needed to be enough hints to what he was thinking, so that when he says it, you it all falls into place, and you think, oh well, that's what that was about. Um, and here he does erupt. This is the monster coming out. Now this little bit of memory of a... Come on, Jimmy. Um, Whale did have... He built this pool for a man that he brought back from France in 1950. And um, that relationship ended. And he did have parties like this quite often. So this is um, not at all a stretch. This is another another scene that, that um, changed from script form because of time initially I was going I was playing with images from the invisible man and there was going to be this pool party and then clay uh, in a bathing suit off to the side and then whale sort of unwrapping himself the way the invisible man does until he's nothing but the cigar which walks over to clay and then starts to pull at the at the uh, at his trunks you know which again in this moment of reverie would have been something funny which I think if uh, you're not f familiar with Whale's movies, the, the, he obviously made history with the Frankenstein movies and uh, the brilliant showboat, the first showboat. But his real contribution in all of his films was the way that he mixed um, tones and moods. He'll, there'll be a moment that's full of tension that's followed immediately by something that's funny, followed by something that's moving um, he really showed that you can do more than one thing at once I think um, he always told a story about taking some friends to a revival of Bride of Frankenstein in Pasadena and uh, they were all laughing and a woman turned around and said if you don't enjoy the picture why don't you just go home I think Curtis mentions that on the um, the documentary but um, that's definitely something we inspired to hear. By the way, this is another obvious reference to Frankenstein when Frankenstein first sees himself in the in the water. Um, and Brendan here now taking a look at his own life. Yeah, we're trying to, um, as I said, make a picture about whale and the whale style. And as he said in, er, in an earlier scene in describing Bride of Frankenstein as a comedy about death, I think that's what uh, we were up to here too, two ideas that don't necessarily belong together. You know, later on, there's a scene where um, Hannah and Clay throw Whale's body into the water, and it's funny in the middle of something that's pretty tragic, um, very Orton-esque, I think. Uh, that is something I just so love about Whale's films, and it's something that makes them still so fresh. This scene uh, we shot with Whale listening to a recording of Noel Coward at the Sands, which was great, and obviously there's a connection between Will and another self-created gentleman like Howard, but we, again, no money for those rights, so, um, but Carter did a wonderful job, I think, of musically suggesting the growing connection between these two. Um, and as you see, as the movies progressed, we have now spent more time with Clay's character. He has, I think we're starting to be more interested in, in what makes him tick, and, and um, in any case, um, to backtrack a little and get to the story of the film we're out of Sundance we have no distributor but the one thing that has happened is that there are um, critics who, who have started to write about the movie um, 
Lisa Schwartzbaum, and Owen Gleiberman in Entertainment Weekly, and Dave Kerr, and especially Peter Travers, who sort of took it up as a cause, um, begged Harvey Weinstein to pick it up uh, with no luck. And it really was those people who um, uh, c- uh, caused other companies to s- take a second look at it. And one of them was Lionsgate, and they finally picked up the film, and they've been incredible since then, I have to say. They did a, um, They were exactly, I think they, they almost see themselves as being what Miramax was a few years ago, uh, pre, pre-corporate Miramax. Uh, they took on the film in, in um, oh God, I guess it was, wasn't until June. And I have to say, every step along the way then, it's a movie that, just as it seemed to have settled into one niche, it, it has been the press and critics who have kind of pushed it on to the next level. You know, we um, got a good response coming out of the New York Film Festival, and then we opened, and that was very nice, and the critics, again, were incredibly um, supportive of the film. And we were settling into what seems like a pretty typical, uh, mildly successful art house run. In fact, one of the difficulties uh, when we were talking to dist- to distributors that they mentioned something called the Gay Three, that because this had enough gay content, it would be seen as a gay movie, and there's a ceiling of $3 million um, that movies like Love, Valor, Compassion, and Jeffrey hit, and they don't get beyond that, that that is the size of the gay audience. Of course, I always argued that um, it's not just a gay movie, that there are, you know, just by virtue of everything it's about, it appeals to... um, people who aren't gay, and also there's a, because of James Whale, uh, there's a huge horror audience that would be interested in it too, and, you know, the history of Hollywood, and then just Ian McKellen's performance in Lynn's, you know, um, people who are just interested in in, um, more traditional art house fare. But I have to say, we had stalled out at that level, and then uh, the National Board of Review gave us an award, and there are a number of others that followed right out of that, Critics Awards, and... um, we managed to, you know, to um, it just gave us a whole other lease on life. So, you know, in recent years, I've been despondent about uh, critics and, and the press in general. It just seemed like so often they were just another arm of the studio, publicity arm, and sort of just ratifying the verdict, the commercial verdict on a film. And it's, it's really, it's amazing to see uh, a film like this that really is created by them that that uh, again they they sort of take up as a cause and 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 keep keep pushing until finally they force people to see it I think it was also nice to be embraced um, by the independent film community because the one thing about whale is that he found this niche within the studio system um, in the early to middle 30s junior Lemley who ran Universal really took a shine to him and let him have his way. There was not anybody looking over his shoulder. And and I think that's why those movies uh, endure, because they just couldn't... They couldn't be anybody else's. And every frame of them, you know, has his vision and personality in them. And, and um, he controlled it all, you know. Um, uh, such, a, such a rare uh, position for somebody in that system. And um, so I think it's appropriate that... If a film that a film made about his life uh, was done in the same way, and one of the fun things about um, having this movie out there is that it really has sparked a revival of interest in Wales films. This plus the comeback of Gloria Stewart in Titanic. She'd been in two uh, early films of his, Invisible Man and Old Dark House, a wonderful biography that uh, came out this year by James Curtis. Universal made new prints of many of his films, and I know that now that. Um, a lot of them are going to be released on DVD and special editions, and uh, David Skull, uh will be doing some some uh, uh, supplementary um, work on those. Uh, people are seeing his films again, and that is very, very fun. And it's my favorite um, experience was at the uh, Hamptons Film Festival where they showed Gods and Monsters, and then Bride of Frankenstein. It was something I'd always wanted to see, those two movies back-to-back, and it was very fun to see uh, the way they informed each other.
Of course, Will didn't live to see any of this. In um, the early 50s, when he was in London, Gavin Lambert uh, organized a screening of Old Dark House, and um, it was very well attended and enthusiastically received. And he was very moved by it, but for the most part, he he um, dismissed them when anyone would try to take them seriously, especially the Frankenstein movies as trifles. Um, so, um, and just thought of himself as a forgotten director. Really, that whole yeah, sure. cult of the director had just, as an idea, had just started by the time he died. And um, actually, we, we fudge a little. And um, Frankenstein wasn't even shown on TV until uh, a few months after he died. You know, there are some people who do try to make Whale into something of a gay martyr to suggest that the reason his career ended was that... Um, as we were going into the world, Second World War, that people were clamping down on, on um, uh, you know, all the sort of bohemian fun of the 30s and specifically on gays, and he was, he was kind of put in exile. It's really, really uh, not true. It, it really was that, that um, the Lemley family lost control over Universal, as I said, during the making of The Road Back, uh, the German government had put a tremendous amount of pressure on the Lemleys not to make the film. It was a sequel to All Quiet on the Western Front, and of course, Remark's work was banned in Germany. And of course, the Lemley family had resisted this, but when these WASP bankers from New York took over, they were um, more open to the idea of watering the film down, because Germany, of course, was a huge market. Uh, so not only did they re-edit the film and um, it bombed and he could say nothing about it, of course it had his name on it, but also now this special place that he had was gone and he worked out, you know, uh, uh, did a couple of B pictures to get out of his contract at Universal, made some nice movies at other, other studios, The Great Garrick, the original Man in the Iron Mask, but also got a taste of what it was like to work under those studio constraints. He was someone who had started late. He was already well into his 40s when he made Bride of Frankenstein. He was in his 50s now. He had saved his berries, as he said, and um, didn't have to do it. And it had stopped being fun for him. Also, having had the kind of bad luck that anybody faces, a few failures in a row, he wasn't being offered the best stuff. And so he really walked away. Something I quickly wanted to point out here if you go back and look at that shot of Lynn Redgrave, it was a, that was uh, filmed on the first day that uh, Lynn worked. And Lynn and I both looked at it the next day and realized that there was still a little bit of Lynn Redgrave left. You know, we were trying so hard to, to uh, create this image that would make her almost unrecognizable. And she figured out what it was, that she needed to tuck her neck down, um, I mean, tuck her chin down into her neck. And that's what she does through the rest of the movie, and I think that's what makes her seem so different. But if you look at that, you'll see that she looks a little different from the way she does in the rest of it. And of course, here we are now at the Cuker party. We actually shot this first because it was such a big scene, it involved so many extras, that I knew if I waited a week that we might be already kind of looking for places to cut, not we, the producers, and uh, I should really uh, get this uh, finished with. Um, so here we have uh, Cuker's house. If you notice, Richard Sherman added these black and white drapes that are really done in the style that Cecil Beaton brought to My Fair Lady, which was on stage in 1956, a year before this takes place, and of course was made into a film by George Cuker in 1964. And here, Princess Margaret is confusing him for, for uh, Cecil Beaton, so that's just a, a little joke in there. Um, Ian knows Princess Margaret, and... Um, I'm not sure he's crazy about her, but he did say, he called me just before he came to shoot, and he said, well, I've just had my last dinner with Princess Margaret, knowing that after she saw this, she probably wouldn't be inviting him over anymore. Um, yeah, Cukor here. Kevin Thomas, the critic for the Los Angeles Times, was a friend of Cukor's, and he took real exception uh, to this portrayal of Cukor as being that closeted saying that he was in these circles more relaxed about it, which is true, but but um, dramatically I think it's so effective to have him as a foil for the way Whale led his life. And in fact, Cukor did have this kind of 
split existence. Yeah, Lynn Redgrave, when she read the script, um, said that she was just amazed to hear this early description of the pool parties uh, that followed the sort of grand, grand parties the night before because her father, Michael Redgrave, had been to both of them and she'd seen scrapbooks of both the famous faces and uh, the boys in swimming trunks. So um, Whale really didn't do that. Whale lived with David Lewis so openly and they went to all the famous restaurants we've all read about together and uh, uh, so there, there really was a distinction. This was um, again one of the first scenes we shot and at the end when Ian says, just the one. Um, I was so afraid you'd hear me laugh. That was another ad lib of his, and I just knew we were in, in good shape from day one when he was coming up with things like that. This house of, is um, much bigger than Cukor's house actually was. Again, um, slightly, uh, you know, dramatically as a contrast to the more simple way Whale lived, and certainly Cukor did live in a grander style. This is a house in Pasadena that's been used as a location for decades now. It was used in duck soup. It was uh, that pond we saw earlier was where Alexis and um, Crystal had their um, famous catfight in Dynasty. It's a very cheap location, and um, uh, that gives you a sense of um, kind of Beverly Hills grandeur. So, again, the challenge was to make it look different and... and um, Richard managed that with, I think, all of the dressing that he brought in. In this next scene, um, the swans, that was meant to be sort of, again, a, a, a kind of reference not to a whale film, but to the kind of 50s widescreen film that someone like Vincent Minnelli would make. Uh, that's what I had in mind. And then when Ian, Ian uh, saw them, he didn't know I was shooting that. He said, well, you realize, of course, that... Um, all the swans in England belong to the queen, that you can't do anything to a swan, you can't kill them, you can't, they uh, are all her property. So I thought, well, that was another nice little meaning to that. Now we're coming on to the scene where Ian is reunited with his monsters. And um, again, Rosalind was able to straddle the two times and was very um, brave in letting Bruce Finlayson add a little fanny and tummy to her. Uh, and then Jack Betts, who you'll see very shortly as uh, Boris Karloff. In real life, Jack is um, a dead ringer for the older Clark Gable. But uh, Karloff left behind a number of life masks, so we were able to um, take one of those and make an impression of his features and then apply that latex to, um, Karloff, uh, to uh, Jack's face to make him look like the monster. And of course, this is the scene where the connection between the monster that Whale created a long time ago and the one that he might be creating now is um, made most explicit in these shots where he actually lines them up and tries to sort of uh, compare the two. And um, there are some people, I've read some people think that that's... Uh, sort of overdone and too heavy-handed, but I really did want it... It's not that I wanted it to be clear. I thought it was clear, but I thought there was just great fun to be had. It was something to to come back to over and over again because it just got to the heart of uh, what was going on thematically. You know, the whole movie comes to that point where we show the scene between the blind man and the monster and Bride of Frankenstein, and, and it is just a variation on that scene um, in trying to kind of restore... The emotional punch of that scene, I think, um, that's helped by continually making these uh, comparisons in the film. So, again, uh, here's Rosalind adding lots of little Lanchester touches, the nonsense especially. I think it sounds so much like her. This is Lanchester around um, bell book and candle time, I think. Elsa. And um, Elsa. and Jay. Jay. here's Jack. Good to see you. I didn't know you were here. These public rebels are hardly up your Very, just there, I think. There's, that's the moment when Rosalind most seems like she really is Elsa. So that was really thrilling. And 
what do you mean? Coochie coup is something that um, Rosalind came up with. And again, this is where they really just are in the same same spot together. And But Whale is um, taken out of this reverie by this Edmund K. character, who I really think is a type you see today, too. People who um, kind of ingratiate themselves and are so hiding such incredible amounts of ambition and suddenly are taking everything over, you know. Um, so this was fun, again, to show the increasing sense of disorientation that Will has to be able to actually connect thematically all these different parts of his life and especially to uh, cut from this Elsa, from our Elsa, to his Elsa. And um, I actually think it, it was, I was afraid of it. I thought, God, that's, that's really going to show it up. But I think she really does look enough like her that, that we could get away with it. And of course, this is really the point at which these two characters finally recognize the connection they have. You know, Whale's movies always concern themselves with the outcast. Um, most famously in the Frankenstein movies, he treats the monster with, with, with such sympathy that you start to resent the, the mob that's trying to get him um, and feel more for him. If you look at Showboat, the... Um, and the way he shoots Paul Robeson, you realize that for him, the character of Joe is really the emotional center of the film. And of course here, they both, these two characters admit to each other that neither one belongs. And uh, despite all the, the ways in which they're different, that really is something so basic that they have in common. And it's, it's uh, um, I think it, it's the bond that they, that only deepens from here on to, uh, to the end of the movie. And now here's the image of the soldier, who I think on an obvious level represents, you know, Whale being Whale? sort of invited, invited, beckoned uh, toward this death that he might have had so long ago. And also, there's a sense, I think, in which there was something um, in the love that he had for this boy that once it was destroyed and combined with all the other horrors of the First first World War, created a kind of ironic detachment that has protected him through all those years. And I think that's the, that's what, um, that's the reason this Brendan, this Clay character is, is uh, uh, Brendan Fraser's character is um, dredging up those memories for him because in, in his own, as he said, that open face, suddenly he's face to face with something um, that, um, has no, uh, uh, someone who has no feeling for irony and someone who is so simple as he sees him. Um, again, I described this before, suddenly we're into these Dutch angles and and uh, a more, you'll see now, a, a more expressionist approach that uh, applies really from here to um, the end of the, the, the big scene between these two. A storm starting obviously helps. Um, here now, this character, the soldier, is just there. I mean, the sense of what's real and what isn't, I think, is starting to, to blur. And angles like this, you know, um, this is the kind of stuff that would have appeared more in a whale movie than anything we, we've seen before. I remember when we looked at these dailies, there, there are some moments, and especially this one, when, whale, when uh, Ian's wearing the bow tie, where he looks just so remarkably like James Whale. Whale, I thought, resembled Joseph Cotton, and I think Ian, Ian resembles him there. This is a, um, a conceit, this idea that Whale holds on to the, um, has kept the, um, the sketch of the monster. Um, that was not true in real life, but again, visually, I think this is a way to make so many connections. Um, and obviously became such an appropriate gift for Will to give to Clay at the end of the film. I'd like to say a few words about the scene that we're about to see, which is the um, scene in the kitchen where um, Clay reveals that he was never a Marine. It starts, obviously, with, with uh, Will asking again the question about having whether Clay had killed anyone, and it's more specific this time, do you believe in mercy killing? Again, 
flirting with with uh, uh, telling the audience more than they may need to know at that point, but also um, I think preparing them for what's about to happen. Um, in the novel, Clay hadn't been to the Marines, but it was something that he never did reveal uh, to Whale. And um, in general, I think one of the differences between novel and film is that uh, Chris Chris um, has, I think, probably a very accurate view of, of um, interactions between people. Uh, these rich interior monologues that go on with everyone sort of misunderstanding what everybody else is up to. And then some cataclysmic event which makes people blurt out the truth that changes things for a while and then everyone sort of gets back into their own head again. Um, so it felt important to me, obviously, uh, dramatically, that they would have more effect on each other. So that's why I had Brendan finally admit this to um, Ian Clay, admit it. And um, what I love in the way that Ian plays this, you'll see this coming up. Brendan really bears his soul here and talks about a moment of humiliation at his father's hands. And Ian, rather than just sympathizing, you'll see at the moment when Brendan says that uh, his father laughed at him, he looks away and I think Ian reveals so much that, that it's not hard to, to realize that he's thinking of his own father at that point. And then, at the most revealing moment, Ian looks back to Brendan and it's not with a look of sympathy, it's with, with, the, it's with the director's eye now, it's with, ooh, I can use this. And this is something that I think only an actor like Ian McKellen can bring to a scene. I mean, there, you know, it was all there, um, we discussed it all, but to actually, actually show all of those different ideas, um, it just still amazes me. Um, this one I'm talking about now, this is when suddenly he's kind of wandered out of the conversation into his own memories. And then this look, like, ah, that's something I can do something with. And Brendan, of course, so, so um, vulnerable at that moment. And of course, this all leads on now to the final scene. We had decided to um, shoot these scenes in the house in sequence so that because we knew that the scene coming up would be very very difficult to get right and so intense that it felt that it felt like the actors needed to have gone through everything else to get to here and of course the problem with that is on a low budget movie you're always stealing from tomorrow and by the time we got to this scene we had very very little time left in fact we shot this and the fight afterwards James Whale and then moved on to the um, studio that day and shot a scene with Elsa Lanchester, flashback of the bride set. So that was where we were at that point. We were into the fourth week and just trying to get everything done. So one thing here that's a bit of a regret is that as uh, Whale tells the story of Barnett's death, I had planned a final flashback where uh, you see Barnett coming toward you and and finally being killed and Whale is just a set of eyes, a pair of eyes looking looking at this and he reveals himself to be Whale as he is now in that trench and that look on Ian's face I can just imagine what it might have been as he sees this boy die um, but we didn't have the chance to do that and and so um, we were just left with um, Ian's face in the present which is good enough I think I mean he really Ultimately, that's what this movie comes down to, um, and um, he he made this very very moving. I think um, this is also where we make explicit some of the connections between this experience that he had in the world first world war and I think a more contemporary uh, experience that people can connect to, which is AIDS, you know, a whole generation wiped out by that war, that sense of survivor's guilt, that sense that no matter what these problems are that he's facing now, at least he got to get old and again to become old and have these problems. So I think Ian was beautifully able to suggest that too. 
death too, but I tell you, for each man... I have to say that this scene also represented the only time in our rehearsals where the actors and I, both Brandon and Ian and I, had differences of opinion about how to, how to, um, how to approach it. One thing that, for example, that you knew in the novel was that this whole idea that he was drawing Brandon, uh, drawing Clay was, was a sham, you know, that he really had lost his talent for drawing. And um, I really wanted to withhold that fact until the end and, and save it for when Whale was, um, had already told Clay that he wanted him to kill him. And almost as, a, as the final argument, the, these drawings have spilled out on the, floor and in this gothic sort of flourish of lightning um you see just how distorted and and um disturbing they are uh it's one of those ideas you have that then you try to go on stage and it just became so messy we tried it so many different ways that um Ian started to argue for this revelation earlier, which I was... The only thing that worried me about it was that then, uh, in in the earlier version, when Brendan still thought that he could draw, him, he offers his body up as an inspiration, as, you know, uh, something to take his mind off of it. But now that he knows that there is, there is um, nothing, then um, uh, it's, a, it's a different gesture. But... As I thought about it, I realized that the gesture actually becomes more pure. So that's something where I initially disagree with Ian, and he convinced so me, and now like I know that he was right. Um, and then here, my only argument was that initially we had we had talked about actually having Brandon nude there, um, just because I felt it was a movie that didn't pull its punches, and I didn't want to at that point. Um, and Brandon made a good argument for the fact that that could take you out of a film at that point, and I actually think he was right too, I must say, that even though I always plan to shoot it in that window and have it be very, very uh, subtle, still I think it really is such a delicate moment that anything like that probably would have been a mistake. So there you go. Um, now we come to this moment of complete disorientation where he's seeing the monster everywhere in the kitchen handing him the gas mask and taking it back for the final confrontation and this image of um, Clay wearing the mask from the novel I just always thought it was such a beautiful way to combine all the horrors of Will's life into, into one picture it really in fact there was a, an early poster that was nothing but a man with a nude torso and wearing a gas mask that I thought was so brilliant and abstract but of course you couldn't see that it was Brendan Fraser and he was who he was trying to, we were trying to sell so that didn't work so this is the scene that we were leading up to and we were all very afraid of I think because obviously it's a incredibly um, extreme idea this using Brendan's fear of homosexuality, Clay's fear of homosexuality, to, uh, and pushing all the buttons and to get him to kill him in a final act of creation. Um, we knew it was the hardest one to sort of bring the audience along with, and, and um, again, we, I think we put it off because we, we all uh, weren't quite sure it was ever going to work. Um, but ironically, I think it was the the rushed nature of having to shoot it this way that actually got it there. Um, it was, it really never came alive in rehearsals and it finally did here. I was also afraid, that, you know, having um, created this comedy about death where the audience is laughing through so much of the picture that at this moment, I, you know, um, that they would not go along with us, you know, and um, because it is so it's so out there that they would um, laugh in a way. I, that was, I would have to say, um, the most anxious moment I had at Sundance, you know, just never having seen it with an audience, wondering if, if um, they would 
uh, follow us along with this idea, and, and they did. And, and I have to say, I've seen it in lots of different places and lots of audiences. And, and um, uh, you know, they do understand what's going on here. And, of course, that's a tribute to these both of these actors. It was interesting. We had a screening um, at the AFI, and Gloria Stewart introduced it and told wonderful stories about James Whale. And uh, then the movie started, and I realized that she had never seen it before, had never read the book or the script, so we could have a very public walkout. Suddenly she could, she could, um, could have been offended at, at uh, this portrait of Whale, but, but luckily she wasn't. She said that uh, Ian had really, really captured him, and, and uh, she also revealed that she'd been in love with him. She thought the one thing that we didn't quite get was that his... his uh, Wit could be very, very cruel, especially uh, when, when uh, in a work situation, and uh, he could really just, just effortlessly destroy somebody, you know. Um, but I thought about it, and, and really, because we're seeing him at such a later point in life, it, it, um, I have to say that that uh, all the people I know who knew him talk instead about his generosity and kindness and said that the wit was wicked but but um playful always right here i have to say this sigh of ian's um just that sense that he's just too tired to go on i just think is so beautiful among the many extraordinary moments that he created you could say it's almost shakespearean he in this next scene, he, um, okay? um, pray you undo this button, a quote from uh, King Lear. There are a few others, oh, this too, that this too, too solid flesh should melt. All of those were things that Ian added um, because Whale had been a Shakespearean actor. And, and um, again, I thought um, it seemed an appropriate idea, and only somebody like Ian McKellen can really pull that off. Um, now we're coming to the scene where I think everything does really fall into place in the movie. Um, it's the third scene against that stormy sky background, and it truly is starts out as a shot from a whale film, and it does feel like it's in black and white, uh, the monster who's leading whale forward. Um, and of course, then they step into the light, and it's in color, and then you see that it's um, clay. Not a surprise, but I think just finally um, pulls all the pieces together. And then, of course, he um, takes his place among all the soldiers who died all those years ago. That set um, was actually not copied, but inspired by the set that um, Whale had designed for Journey's End. He had started as a set designer, and uh, he, he um, did the set and directed the play, and then did the same for the film on a soundstage. And we did this on a soundstage too. And Whale climbs down. There's actually, it's hard to see, it didn't come out, but there's actually running water right behind Leonard Barnett's head. And if you notice, the position that, that um, Ian McKellen takes is exactly the position that he uh, winds up in in the pool at the end. So there's a real, just again, hints all the way through this, this obviously, that, that he's, this is our version of him killing himself going into that pool. And then the telephone rings, and um, it's Brendan who opens his eyes. Um, so it's a moment, too, where they're almost sharing dreams, you know. Um, everything that happens in this scene is something Brendan could have imagined based on what Whale told him the night before about the World War and, and his fate and also asking him to, to help him die. Um, and as you get to the end of the movie, you realize that it's actually bookended by Clay's character. It starts with Clay opening his eyes, and it ends with Clay walking in the rain. And, and um, I think it's possible to read the movie as a, a 
Clay kind of piecing together what Whale might have been going through at that period um, and um, trying to make sense of it finally years later. You see here Hannah picking up the gas mask and the, the drawings, domesticating everything again. Um, and also, just I had mentioned, meant to mention before, um, the spr the flowers everywhere. That was something. If if you look at Whale's movies, they're in all of the scenes. Again, again, he had so much to do with the design of his films, and Richard took took his cue from that and and um, spent a lot of his budget just on those. I think. Um, so now we come up to the scene of um, whales being discovered in the pool. There's been this sense that there's some mystery surrounding Will's death. Um, David Lewis, in 1957, suppressed the suicide note and told the press that it was an accident. And because it was an older gay figure and a Hollywood figure and someone who had made horror movies, of course, immediately people started to speculate on what might have happened. So, uh, with so many rumors floating around, he finally years later had to release a copy of the note to prove that it was a suicide but once that's happened and you've been in Hollywood Babylon I, I think in Hollywood Babylon too um, Kenneth Anger wrote about that there's really n no way to get over that so I mean even as recently as last year there was this really sleazy E entertainment um, special on the mysterious death of James Whale so, um, I hope this movie can at least put those rumors to rest. This really, he really did kill himself. It was a willful way to do it. He, he didn't swim and he dove into, he did put on his favorite suit and, and uh, dove into the shallow end of his pool and cracked his head open on the, on the bottom of the pool. And this is a moment that came out of rehearsal that I really, um, thought was wonderful, Lynn revealing, Hannah revealing the depth of feeling she had for Whale. In, in essence, they, they did have this marriage. They were at the end of their lives. Clay shouldn't be found there. And of course, Clay is a, an invention of Chris Bram's. Um, and this is the moment that he steps out of this history and um, you know, in terms of the conceit becomes invisible again. They're going to have to throw Whale's body back in and then Clay will disappear. As I mentioned before, I think a very kind of Joe Wharton-like moment. In the score here, this theme that Carter's created, starts to be played on the violin, and then we cut to the original Frankenstein, and we're actually, we've replaced the music from that film with our own music, so it, the two movies have merged in a way. We've, we've kind of become part of that, and, and um, this whole ending sequence is, is different from the novel. I felt that it would be so interesting to bring, uh, again, Clay back to the film again, and uh, to have him understand where he existed in the film and where Whale, Whale was in the film now that he really knew Whale. Um, this is a scene, obviously, that was famously lampooned by Mel Brooks and Young Frankenstein with Gene Hackman playing the blind man. And another risk, because I thought as soon as anyone saw the blind man, they would start to giggle. But that didn't happen. And the little boy watching the film just felt like me and everybody else I know that we discovered this movie on television, really. And it's where the film endures. Um, here again, Clay is watching. I don't think, other than the last image of him with his arms out, the intercutting between him smoking and, and uh, the monster smoking, and I, I hope the memory of the cigar scene in, in the movie itself uh, really does does uh, finally connect all those dots. I admit this coda is makes for an awkward transition, uh, suddenly cutting to Clay's life years later, and 
It has disturbed me that some people have read it as a scene that confirms that he turned out happy and straight because, first of all, I don't think there's anything interesting in speculating that he wasn't straight before. I mean, the whole point is that, by the way, let me interrupt myself and say a good cast is worth repeating is something you're about to see in a minute that was uh, at the he head of uh, many universal films in the 30s. And um, rather it's something, you know, the, the boy says is another one of your stories. I think it was just intended to show that Clay finally does have stories to tell, that Whale and his interaction with him was the great story of his life, and he probably hasn't told the whole thing to anybody yet. Um, but more than that, um, it was a first step toward making a, a kind of connection, uh, a kind of healthier connection with his father, and, and uh, then starting to make a connection with other people, um, which I think gets to the essence of not only this movie, but also The Bride of Frankenstein. And of course, there's Brendan's lesbian wife, as I said before. And then this final image, another example of things that people see that weren't intended. Um, someone said they saw almost a, sh a Shroud of Turin type um, image of Christ in this uh, upcoming shot, and I couldn't imagine what they were talking about. But it's there. Um, coming up and it's on the left in the lightning um, oh you see right in the middle actually now um, oh, as it clears this tree right there there's a figure it looks less less so on video but you can see it um, on the film and anyway also untended and um, finally this last image which and Brendan added the little scene in the rain thing again wasn't sure this idea would work at all, and it was only seeing Brendan... Oh, I'm sorry, there it is, to his left. There's that Christ thing. Um, it was only seeing Brendan do it that um, m made me realize that, again, someone's so com comfortable in his own skin, you know, and, uh, and that made me think that it could really work. Um, so I could go on and on, I think, but um, the movie's over, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs>